Welcome to the 2016 Alaska Fire Presentation Series. It is being brought to you by the Alaska Natural Resource and Outdoor Education Association, or ANRO. ANRO is dedicated to promoting and implementing excellence in natural resource, outdoor, and environmental education for all Alaskans. My name is Kathy Rezebeck, and I would like to introduce our speaker today, Ed Berg. Ed held the ecologist position at the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge for 17 years, prior to his retirement in 2010. He has been an adjunct instructor in geology at the Kenai Peninsula College since 1983. He has a PhD in botany from the University of Georgia. Today, he will be talking about fire and vegetation in a changing climate on the Kenai Peninsula, a 14,000 year record. Welcome, Ed. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, this is Ed Berg speaking. Uh, well, so today we've, we've got uh, kind of the grand overview there of how uh, the forests and fire regimes have changed uh, since the end of the last glacial period. Uh, and then we've got uh, some more detailed look at, at two fires uh, in, specifically. So here is a quick overview of the, uh, the subjects for the day. We'll start with uh, looking at the last couple hundred years of uh, fire activity in the Kenai. And then we'll bounce back and ask how does that fit in with the uh, evolution of vegetation since the end of the glacial period. We'll look in detail at two of the big historic fires here, 1947 and 69. And we're, we're very privileged to have um, permanent plot data covering the um, forest regrowth in the 1947 burn there. And I'll show you some of that for um, four of the, the permanent plots. Uh, we'll look at the, uh, the various types of fire activity that we have on the Kenai. Um, and then we'll bounce back into the past and we'll look at a, a very long period of drought, about 5,000 years of very dry climate. Um, and I think we are headed back toward that degree of drought now. So uh, that will be a, a theme that I'll develop here at, at the end. And I think that drying has already started in 1968. And part of that uh, drying will be the end of uh, white and Lutz spruce that we have on the Kenai. Uh, and then what will replace that? That's the big question. So uh, one possibility is that uh, we will become a, a grassland or savanna. And another possibility is that it might be hardwood forest under an intense fire regime. So here is the Kenai Peninsula and the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge, and we're, we're focused today on the, the western side there, uh, west of the mountains. Those mountains provide a uh, dramatic rain shadow. You can see the Harding Ice Field over there in Prince William Sound further to the right has captured uh, the precipitation and not much gets over onto the western Kenai. And that's why we have uh, the potentially uh, extreme drying situation. Well, in terms of fire activity, um, you can see on this map that the, uh, the fires are mostly uh, on the northern end of the western Kenai. Um, not very many down around Kachemak Bay here. The uh, 1947 burn is our second biggest fire, and we'll look at that in detail. And then over here to the left, the west of it is the 1969 burn, a very severe mineral soil exposing fire. Well, uh, since uh, the new century arrived, we've been having more spring dry grass fires. Um, and um, moving a little bit further south, the Caribou Hills fire, you can see there is, is moving into the, uh, the southern Kenai. So this is, uh, this is something new here. And um, they raise the possibility of uh, fires that, that uh, essentially fertilize the grass and allow uh, the development of a savanna or grassland condition. Well, we've had, uh, since 
in the last couple of years, a couple of large fires there. That uh, Funny River fire is uh, the largest fire that we've been able to document. Um, and then last year, the uh, Card Street fire. But both of these, uh, again, were spring fires that uh, don't seem to have exposed much mineral soil. So we've done a lot of fire history work on the on the Kenai here. Um, probably the first uh, effort was looking at, at black spruce, which is a very flammable fuel type. Many of the fires up in the interior are burning in black spruce. And Andy DeVolder in his master's thesis uh, looked at fire scars on black spruce trees and had about a 300 year record and figuring the fire return interval uh, was averaging about 80 years between fires. Uh, then we had a much longer record, about 13,000 years, done by Scott Anderson. Um, this was a lake sediment charcoal. We took a seven meter core out of Paradox Lake. There are about 50 feet of water and analyzed that in detail and we'll go over that record, both for the pollen and the charcoal in it. But the uh, in the last 4,000 years, the fire return interval in that sort of mixed hardwood spruce forest was about 130 years. Um, before then, it was you know probably twice as frequent as that. Um, and the third method was using soil charcoal. Basically, we did this in the, the southern peninsula in the areas that were logged. Uh, birch trees were left by the loggers, and then they would blow down and, and turn up a nice throw mound, and we would look for charcoal there in the throw mounds. And we found that really the, the southern Kenai, the forest did not burn very often. The fire return interval was like 400 to 600 years. And there were some stands that we looked at that hadn't burned for 2,500 years. So fire is rare on the south end of the peninsula. Well, here is a, a grand overview of the northern hemisphere temperature records, just to kind of introduce you to some of the time periods and the terminology. This is from the Greenland Ice Core. They have uh, about 110,000 year record. So we're looking at the last uh, 22,000 years, uh, kind of the top of the core there, but since the end of the last glacial period. Now one of the notations that I use is, is Ka, you'll see down here on the bottom scale, that's 22,000 years, 18,000 years. And Ka means kilo annum. It's uh, sometimes just easier to do that and write out all those zeros. Um, well, how much colder was it in the last glacial period? Um, really not a whole lot colder. Uh, the, the reference now, this is like the 20th century reference line up here zero. So, you know, we were maybe four degrees centigrade or seven degrees colder. It really doesn't take a whole lot of uh, coldness to, to bring on a glacial period. Um, these dates here, Skelak, Moose, Horn, Kili, Elmendorf are, are some of the uh, glacial advances that we have uh, seen on the Kenai. Um, they're occurring during a warming period. Um, you know, warm weather can sometimes bring more snow and, uh, you know, more ice accumulation. Uh, then there's the Younger Dryas period that's seen all over the Northern Hemisphere it was a cold snap. There, just when people thought the glaciers, glacial period was really ending, it took a turn for the cold again. Um, but then after that, uh, it warmed up, and then we have this boundary here at 11.7. The, the Holocene period is um, basically the, uh, the post-glacial period. Uh, and we, have, we come into a warming period. You can see this long, period, many thousands of years of warming. Um, that's kind of how it was seen in, in, in Greenland. Uh, the warm period in Alaska didn't last that long. It was more this 11.5 to 9 Ka. Um, but uh, basically it seemed to have started in Alaska and then moved eastward. There's so on the east coast and probably Greenland. Um, it's lasting longer. Um, we had a little warm period, a medieval warm period here when the Norse settled in Greenland. And then we have the little ice age when the Norse were frozen out of Greenland, dipping here 
And now you can see we're up to about this point here. And then the forecast uh, is bringing us, you know, like three degrees centigrade or 5.4 degrees above the uh, 20th century reference line here. And this is a moderate forecast up here. I mean, it, it could be a good deal warmer than that, especially if business as usual is continued in the uh, burning of fossil fuels. Well, okay, so here's a brief view of the uh, vegetation response. This is one of the, maybe the oldest uh, pollen record that we have, uh, Hidden Lake, um, a core of lake sediments that are about three meters long. And it shows the, um, the arrival of, of birch here at 17,000 years. Before then, we're looking at um, basically grass, you know, graminoid, uh, sage, artemisia, and herb, you know, a tundra environment. And then dwarf birch uh, is rolling in big time here at about 17,000 years. Um, we see alder coming in uh, quite well here at about 11,000 years. And then as the climate begins to cool a little bit, uh, white spruce is moving in here, and then later on we'll see another record uh, from Paradox Lake where at about 4,000 years black spruce is, is moving in. But all of these shifts in vegetation are in response um, to climate change, as, as we'll see. So I want to look now um, in more detail at the, the two big historic fires. We'll look first at the 1947 fire, which uh, I like to think of as a normal fire. It, it occurred during an ordinary summer. Um, it burned all summer because they really didn't have very many people to put on this fire. So it kind of went its own way and uh, 110,000 acres were burned uh, in there. Now in 1969, the fire to the west there, um, there was a Swanson River oil field at stake, so there was a lot more motivation to jump on that and a massive number of uh, cats and, and uh, people were put on it, millions of dollars were spent. So after three years after the burn, the refuge staff decided to set up some permanent plots to monitor the forest regrowth in the 47 burn. And these are uh, along Skelac Loop Road here, which really doesn't show very well on this map. Uh, that's the Sterling Highway to the north and Skelac Lake. Um, so nine plots were, were picked, and these were not random plots by any matter of means. They were subjectively picked to represent the um, a particular vegetation type, like black spruce or aspen, um, and then a particular degree of burn severity as well. So we have you know, both light and severely burned fires. And I, th I think they did a pretty good job of picking uh, representative um, stands, you know, to, uh, to demonstrate this, but it, it makes it impossible to, you know, draw any real uh, statistical conclusions from it. I mean, ideally you would like to have maybe 20 of, of each type <laughs> there or something like that before you uh, could do any statistics with it. Well, this was the system that they used to monitor. The, um, each one of these little squares, six by six feet, is a mill acre, one thousandth of an acre. So it takes a thousand to make an acre. And then there were 10 mill acres oriented in a north-south direction. So here's a photo showing the, um, the wooden frame with the strings and the little nails. So you can string this thing up each time you put it down, there are rebar posts there that uh, go through a hole in the corner. And um, basically, you, you can position these things, you know, pretty much the same each time. And then you count, um, well, most of the plants are counted individually. And I use a little tally click clicker. And then, you know, ideally, you can divide this thing into 100 squares with the string. And, and then you just go click, click, click with the counter and, and they count fairly fast. Now there's some things like, like moss um, where a cover value has to be estimated you know, rather than trying to count uh, 
each particular plant. Well, I'll show you four examples of the, the nine plots. Um, this is a very simple ex example here. This was a, a young black spruce stand that um, was lightly burned. So mineral soil exposure, 0% there. And you can see that the, the black spruce here, um, you know, recruited, uh, and then it kind of leveled off and, and, uh, and then, you know, a few more have been picked up here, but basically it's been pretty stable. There was a, uh, an early blast of cottonwood into this, but none of that survived. Uh, just an interesting case. It's, it's the, really the only plot that I think showed much cottonwood uh, response. Um, the grass and the fireweed took off very well, but they uh, subsided in time as, as the canopy closed. So on all of these slides, the canopy is closing in the 1970s and beginning to shade things out quite a bit. And so then you see the moss takes off. It's, you know, 90% moss cover and some lichen growing on that uh, as well. So here's a picture of what the ground cover looks like. You can see, you know, almost 100% moss ground cover and then Pultigera lichen growing on top of that and some bunchberry and then so forth. Well, in uh, plant number three, there was a terrific flush of aspen suckers. You can see, you know, almost 400 aspen. And these are, are root suckers, you know, clonal propagation. There, the trees were killed, the stems were killed, but not the roots. So the energy is, is going into putting up, you know, new shoots, suckers from the roots, and it's really prolific. But they drop off with time, you know, self-thinning is going on, and, and now there are only nine left on, on the plot down here in 2015. Um, you can see there was um, fairly abundant um, grass and firewood, weed, lupin in, in the early periods as well, but again, th those have all been um, sheltered out, you know, by the, the closing canopy. And the ground cover today is basically leaf litter, and that suppresses the moss and, and the lichen. Well, in number five, the burn severity was quite high, uh, 60%. Um, this is not quite up to the 1969 burn, where it was like 100% over thousands of acres, but um, it's still pretty high. And you can see the um, the black spruce recruits here. There's also birch coming in here, recruiting on that exposed mineral soil, soil but dropping off um, with time. Um, the fireweed starts off quite strong here. Uh, probably th this is clonal propagation from the, the uh, unburned part of the uh, the ground cover, I mean the 40% uh, remaining. Um, it would be interesting to, to look at the genetics um, of that to see whether the fireweed you know, was clonal or whether it was uh, individual plants from seeds. One thing that the, uh, the surveyors did keep track of on uh, these plots was with the aspen whether the aspen seedlings were, were suckers or whether they were seedlings. And uh, the suckers would be quite large, you know, might be two feet tall, where the little seedling might be, you know, three, four inches. So it was a pretty obvious difference, but they, they did keep track of that um, in the surveys. Well, the moss uh, is doing quite well here. You can see 80% cover. Um, so pretty thick at this point. Now, number eight is another uh, moderately burned, 35% mineral soil exposure. Uh, this was a birch stand with some white spruce. Um, you can see the, the frame here is deployed around this birch tree, and then here it is here, and it's still here, still here, but it's down on the ground by 
1995 there, and it's hardly discernible at all by 2015. Um, you could see there was an enormous amount of birch seedling recruitment. Again, this is on the mineral soil, the bare soil, uh, 2,000 seedlings on the plot, but now uh, only 14 birch remaining uh, as adults. Um, there was an alder flush on, on this plot as well. Uh, you see that here, but again, uh, no alders today. So this is one of the beauties of having this historical data. I mean, if you go there today, you would never know that it uh, had gone through an alder flush like that. It's just, uh, you know, there's nothing left to, uh, to record that. Okay, well, um, what happens uh, after a fire and then the forest grows up? Um, basically, a lot of that tree recruitment takes place, you know, in the, the initial years, and then it, it slows down. Um, and so on the Kenai, we would expect that the forest would, would reburn and the, the cycle would start again. But on the southern Kenai, where we don't have much fire, the forest becomes mature and the trees fall down and they produce nursewood. So here are some you know, really nice examples of nursewood. These are hemlock trees from the Pacific Northwest, and this forest has probably never burned. But you can see how the hemlock have germinated up in the air, the, you know, on top of logs and stumps, and then they put down those roots and are, are doing quite well. Um, most of the trees on the, the southern Kenai germinated this way, and they have the, the stilted root appearance that you see over here on the right hand side. Um, it's often possible to stick your hand down in a hole there between the roots and feel, pull out the old nursewood. And here's a simple example, a little baby spruce growing on a, a nurse log 10 years after the Windy Point burn. Well, okay, looking now at um, a more extreme kind of fire, 69 burn. Um, this was uh, basically produced acres and acres of mud that are exposed mineral soil. And the birch recruitment on this soil was just phenomenal. And as a result, this became the number one moose hunting area for many decades and probably still is the best uh, moose hunting area on the Kenai, and, and then hares, of course, loved all the birch. And then everything that eats uh, moose and hares, and, um, you know, the, the raptors and, and wolves and so forth. Uh, so it's, it's probably the most uh, dense wildlife area on the, the Kenai Refuge. And of course the hunters loved it too, so it's, you know, fairly dense with hunters. The weather conditions uh, for that were really quite dry at that time, just looking at the, uh, the monthly precipitation here. And then the temperatures were, were quite warm. Um, so this was uh, the second summer of drought with a dry winter in between. And it was really very dry. And then it had wind-driven fires as well. So it was a, kind of a tough one to put out. Um, here are a few examples of the exposed mineral soil that you see um, there that uh, provides just this beautiful um, bedding spot for the birch seeds, which are distributed in the winter and then germinate in the spring. A um, satellite vegetation map here, 2011, you can see the 1969 burn. The yellow colors are deciduous, you know, hardwood forest, and, uh, and bas basically birch in, the, in this case. And then here's the 47 burn, you know, much, much bigger, but much darker green with conifer forest, uh, although there are certainly areas here of the deciduous forest that were probably more um, severely burned. Well, okay, so essentially we have three types of fire on the Kenai. Uh, we've looked at number two, the normal weather type, 
47 burn. We've looked at number three here, the extreme burn severity under very dry summer conditions. And then we have this more, shall we say, recent type, the dry spring fires that are often uh, pre-green up. And the grass is, is dry and you get uh, like a very dry May and a bit of wind blowing and you can have you know quite the fire developing uh, you know quite quickly and, and these can be scary fires. Um, well here is the Caribou Hills fire 2007 and this is uh, eight years later photograph uh, you can see that the fireweed in the grass is really doing terrific here. Uh, now when these spring fires occur, the soils are typically uh, wet or, or even frozen. So there's very little mineral soil exposure. And the soil gets a terrific pulse of ash from the burned vegetation, so fertilized. And basically the grass and the fireweed takes off after that. So we're thinking, you know, if we get enough of this kind of fire going on, um, this may convert this landscape to a grassland or a savanna. Um, we also have a lot of logging that has been done, um, especially west of the Kenai Refuge on the, uh, the Native Corporation lands. And the grass is doing very well now. The, uh, it's getting a lot of light. And um, one wonders, you know, is, is this uh, a potential grassland. I mean, there is some spruce recruitment going on, you can see here, but an awful lot of this area, you know, is, is pretty uh, extensive grass. And of course, it will support those early spring fires. So the effect of logging is kind of similar to the, uh, the effect of the, uh, the spring grass driven fires. Okay, I'm going to. Um, step back now uh, to the paleo record and see what we can see of these kinds of fires um, in the, the pollen and charcoal record. Um, so here are some of the, the lessons that I, I want to um, bring. That First, that the, um, the landscape vegetation can be stable for thousands of years despite repeated burnings. I mean, it can be a, a spruce forest or a birch mixed uh, forest you know for thousands of years and, and uh, get burned repeatedly and come back the same thing um, we'll see that vegetation changes when the climate changes and you know, on a large scale we'll see the grass uh, has always been a very minor player according to the pollen record um, we'll see that there was an extremely dry period between 14,000 and 9,000 years, and that hardwoods uh, reigned supreme at that time. And we'll see as the climate uh, cooled and got wetter, that uh, it brought first the white spruce and, and then black spruce. And then uh, we'll see once again that the, the Kenai is in a long-term drying trend, and my uh, hypothesis is that we are headed back toward another drought uh, on that same order of the 14,000 to 9,000 year period. Well, here is a, a detailed record of the pollen in Paradox Lake. This is uh, almost a 13,000 year record, uh, seven meter core. Um, it doesn't go back quite as far as that uh, hidden lake record that I showed you that went back to 17,000. So when we look at the, at the birch uh, at the bottom of the core, it's, it's already uh, going full bore here. So this is a shrub tundra period here. And then um, about 11,000 to 10,000 years ago, um, alder comes in big time here. And we're also seeing populus, which would be cottonwood in this case, rather than aspen. And we're seeing willow taking off uh, as well. So. Um, Hardwoods are, are moving in uh, big time. And then um, a little bit later, tree birch gets underway here um, as well. And then about 8,000 years, we see white spruce coming in here. And then kind of uh, four to 5,000 years, 
we see black spruce. Now, um, black spruce, you know, probably did appear a little bit uh, at the same time that white spruce did, but it, it really is, is taking off more here. Um, and that's, there's a definite cooling and wetting of the climate that's taking place at that point, which you'll, you'll see in a minute. Okay, here is the charcoal record from that core, that seven meter core. And basically the charcoal is being analyzed in little one um, cubic centimeter uh, segments of the core, so seven meters, 700 samples, and calculating or measuring the number of charcoal particles in that. And you can see at this period here, the charcoal particles are particularly dense. So this represents a high fire frequency period here. And that information is reinterpreted in this graph here. So it's here we're looking at a fire event frequency of 10 to 12, 14 uh, fires per thousand years here. And on the left, um, from that charcoal measurement here, again, one can calculate in a, in a cubic centimeter of charcoal how many particles you know, per unit time were being deposited. I and mean, if you know the uh, time span that that cube of charcoal or cube of sediment represents, you can calculate that deposition rate. And you can see that that rate varies. This is a logarithmic scale, you know, several orders of magnitude down here at, at the bottom. Well, for a temperature record spanning this period, we have this uh, temperature record here. This is based on pollen. This is, is not from Paradox Lake. This is, uh, um, I think, from a serious lake of lakes in southern Alaska. Um, and the way you reconstruct temperature from pollen is looking at the proportion of warm loving plants and versus cold loving plants. And during the, the warm period here, the hypsothermal period or Holocene thermal maximum, there was a greater proportion of warm loving plants than cold loving plants. And then here as the climate cooled, the proportion shifted and the cold plants came to dominate. I wouldn't say this is a perfect uh, curve here. It's a little too detailed, you might say, but it does show the general warm period of the hypsothermal here and the cooler um, later period, neoglaciation as it's sometimes called because there was glacial advances in the mountains in, in many places during that cooler time. Now, we can just uh, to, to get oriented, uh, 57 degrees is the Sterling July temperature at the present time. That uh, hypsothermal maximum is about 61 here. And then the, um, the forecast mid-range emissions scenario is, is 62 degrees by 2100. You know, at the end of this century, they're forecasting, you know, five degrees warmer temperature than, than the present time. And this is from the, um, the SNAP, the Scenarios Network for Alaska Planning Group uh, at the UAF that makes these uh, forecasts for specific communities. So I've looked specifically at Sterling there, which is kind of in the center of the, the Kenai Refuge there in uh, near Paradox Lake, for instance. Well, okay, so I've added now the, the fire record and that temperature record to the, uh, the pollen record that I showed you before. And um, the pollen record can be divided into these uh, vegetation zones, you might say, starting with the, the dwarf um, dwarf birch tundra and then moving up into the, the hardwoods here and then spruce and birch recruiting here and then black spruce being added for the uh, kind of the modern form. But um, the present, the forest has been in probably the present form for the last 4,000 years. And as you could see before, well, over here, you know, it's burned repeatedly um, during that time. 
and um, you know it's always you know come back pretty much the same. There hasn't been any kind of type conversion because the climate really hasn't changed um, too radically over the last four thousand years. Okay, now over on the left, I've added a lake level record so that we can have some idea about uh, the amount of water. You know, how, how wet is the situation here? And, this, and this, this is a new part of the story. Most of this lake level work comes from work that I've done uh, since I retired here, a lot of peat coring. Uh, and it's showing this, this very dry period here where lake levels are, are, are really way down. And I want to take a bit of time to explain how I determined that, that curve. Um, so I use satellite fins. These are little, you know, peat bogs or, or fins, properly speaking, that are around the edges of lakes. So here you can see one. This is kind of what it looks like on the ground, and the lake is uh, not very visible in the background. Um, here's a LIDAR image of the same things so we're down here at this end, but uh, and, you know, any one of these places would have been interesting to take a core. And I, and I probe uh, with a rod to find the deepest spot, potentially the, the oldest core. Um, now notice that um, this LIDAR image shows up very nicely a shoreline here at 68 meters, and that's about a meter and a half above the modern water level. And the modern water level is constrained by a little outlet here. So I think this is a, a new outlet. I think that this was a closed basin lake for most of its history. And then probably in the last 4,000 years with more a wetter climate, the lake level rose enough that it was able to cut this, this little outlet right here, but you can see how narrow this is. Um, okay, now here is sort of a, a concept example that to explain how I determine um, where the lake level was in the past. So let's say we have one of those shorelines up here where the, the shore has been eroded and, and cut a, a distinct scarp. And let's say that's, that's at 70 feet. And then we have a satellite fin here, and this is terrestrial peat in it. And that of examination of the peat to be sure that it is terrestrial. Uh, so we take a peat core here, and we go all the way down to mineral soil. And then we get a date at the bottom of the peat here. And let's say it's 12,000 years. Well, because this is terrestrial peat, the lake level had to have been drawn down to that level at 12,000 years. Now, it might have been drawn down more. So we're talking about you know, down to 50 feet, 20 foot drop, but you know, maybe it was down 25 or 30 feet. I mean, this is, uh, uh, you're just getting the elevation of this bench right, right here. So I probe and I try and find the deepest place to probe, but, uh, as I say, this is a um, an estimate of the maximum possible lake level, but it could have been lower. Well, peat boring, coring is kind of a, a grunt operation. There's uh, two of my graduate students there punching uh, away. We're getting a, a three inch core, piston Livingston core here. Um, this is an example of from Rainbow Lake. Um, this is drive number seven. We finally hit the bottom. We got down into mineral soil here, clay. And a basal date on the peat here is uh, 11,300 years. And careful examination of the peat here shows this is uh, sphagnum and, and other um, terrestrial peats, um, so that it's not lily pads or aquatic vegetation. Okay, so I've looked at uh, eight lakes in some detail here, and on this graph, we're, we're looking at time down here at the bottom, and then we're looking at, at, at depth below those shorelines, those wave-cut scarps. 
So how much did it drop? Well, the example I showed you, you know, was, was 20 feet. So you can see a lot of these have dropped about you know, 20 and even more than 30 feet. Um, what we don't know is the age when the scarp was cut. It's very difficult to age uh, erosional deposits. I mean, things are taken away. So you have to normally find something that was deposited after the erosion event, and then that gives you kind of a minimum age estimate. But we know that the deglaciation was occurring around 18,000 years ago. So uh, I, I picked that point here. But these dates down here are, are very well determined with, with radiocarbon. And this particular curve here is a series of dates in the deepest core from, from Rainbow, uh, pardon me, from, from Jigsaw Lake here, which was uh, about uh, a core that went down 26 feet below the, uh, the, the, the old shoreline around Jigsaw Lake. Um, but it's, it's showing you know, quite a remarkable drawdown of, of all of these lakes. I mean, every lake that I've looked at, it shows this drawdown. Um, okay, so that's, that's how I, I got the lake level curve over here. And it does you know, give us, uh, I think, you know, further information about the, the, the climate, that this was a very dry time. So we have uh, the fire activity, you know, is, is picking up in, in this time right here. There is probably a lot of mineral soil exposure going on, and that's why the tree birch here was able to take off so well in the alder. I mean, both of those like exposed mineral soil. Um, so this is a period of hardwoods uh, associated with this this very dry time and essentially I think we are headed back toward a time like that where we will see again a high level of fire activity and uh, extreme mineral soil exposure and recruitment of birch on, on top of that. Well here is uh, the most recent part of the story, the, the drying that is underway on the landscape now. So you can see these, these are closed basin lakes where the water level has dropped uh, a meter or more. And uh, here is a, um, a wetland. You look at a forest like that and you think, oh wow, that's, that's some old black spruce stand. You know, those trees have been there for thousands of years and so forth. Well, we ran a transect, two meter wide transect through there and we found out that th these trees are young. The median age was, was 32 years. When we would dig down in the peat, and there, there was more than 15 feet of peat in this, there wasn't any wood underneath. There were no stumps, you know, no buried logs. So this is a, a, a new forest and most of it started recruiting within the, the last 80 years. Um, and many, Wetlands on the Kenai are like this. They show a, a halo of black spruce around, and in some cases, the entire wetland uh, has been covered with this. But uh, this will affect the fire regime because in the past, the wetlands were uh, fire breaks, but now that they're being covered with black spruce, they will become fire bridges. It will bridge the fire from the upland area you know, across a lowland to the next upland. Well, um, we can see you know, why this is happening in our weather records. This is the Kenai Airport data here. And what I'm showing is um, available water. And I like to use available water uh, rather than just precipitation because available water is the water that uh, is available to use on the landscape. So that is calculated by starting with precipitation, annual precipitation or monthly precipitation, and then subtracting the calculated potential evapotranspiration that would be due to evaporation from the, the plants breathing out water, you know, transpiring water, and also evaporation from the soil. So uh, thinking of this in a monetary example, um, 
people, you have an income and then you have basic expenses and the money you have left over, you know, that's your available money. So available water, after you've transpired your expenses uh, that way, you have available water for growing the plants, the animals, for uh, recharging groundwater, for funding stream flow and, and, and so forth. And so that's, it's really the, the usable water. Well, you can see it declined pretty dramatically after 1968 and 69. I mean, we, we've never recovered from that drought. The 69 burn was, was here. Um, if we look forward with the, uh, the SNAP forecasts, they come down to about zero inches of available water uh, by 2100. Um, that's not the end of the world. Uh, as long as you get enough water coming in the spring, you know, the plants will grow, uh, even if you have a dry summer. Um, Anchorage typically runs uh, a negative water balance, maybe a, an inch and a half or something like that. So uh, life, life does go on. Now, it, it could be much more severe than forecasted here. And we're only going to 2100 as well. Climate change goes on you know, well beyond 2100. Well, okay, so how does this affect the vegetation and the fire activity? And specifically, you know, what happens to the white and the Lutz spruce, where we have drought stress and bark beetles? Okay, well, Glenn Jude essentially made the argument that uh, white spruce will go extinct up in the interior. And he was using tree ring evidence for this. On this graph, uh, temperature over here on the left is increasing downward. So it's warmer going down and colder going up. Um, but he's showing um, te temperatures reconstructed from, from tree rings uh, here, which are in the green. And then here are future climate scenarios. I mean, two different uh, scenarios are, are shown and how they affect the ring width over here on the right hand scale. And you can see on this scenario here, the ring width is going to zero by 2100. So this is <laughs> pretty much the end of white spruce if that scenario obtains. I mean, it's, it's zero growth. Um, and um, 0.4 millimeter is not a whole lot better. So. Drought alone would probably be sufficient to extinguish uh, white spruce. Okay, then we add in the spruce bark beetle, especially uh, in southern Alaska. And we know that um, if we average uh, summer temperatures and take two, the past two summer temperatures, um, there's a threshold here of almost 51 degrees where when those two summers average 51 degrees, then one starts to see a lot more beetle kill acres appearing in the, the annual surveys. And so you start seeing a forest that, that looks like this. Uh, really a very distinct threshold there for the beetles. Well, on this graph here, we looking at temperatures. These are the past uh, two summer means and these are projected future ones according to three different climate models and we are up up here uh, from last last summer so we've we're well above this 51 degree threshold and essentially this this means that in, in the future the summers will always be above 51 degrees and any tree that is big enough to be attacked by the bark beetles, you know, will be attacked. So we'll never have large uh, Sitka, uh, Lutz, white spruce forests again. I mean, we could have pole-sized forests that could be cut for pulp, but, um, you know, the, the beetle will set a limit on how big they get. Okay, I'm going to show you some modeling now. Uh, and this, this is just a basic map to get, get oriented. Uh, our forests on the Kenai are classified as this boreal transition uh, zone, all of southern Alaska here. And 
this very sharp line between the, the North Pacific Maritime and the Boreal Transition, I mean, this is the edge, the front of the Kenai Mountains here. And it's pretty wet over here on the east side. Uh, that's catching the rain. And then we're in the rain shadow here and in, in this area more generally, but, but especially on the Kenai, we're really in sort of the, the immediate uh, rain shadow. So I'd like to present now uh, a look at the future here, since we've seen so much of the past. Um, this particularly, particular modeling is called uh, niche modeling. And I'm going to um, show you a series of slides that will go up to the end of the, the century projections of this modeling. And then I'll go back through it again so you can see it twice. Um, <clears throat> what is being modeled here is, is what vegetation could grow according to the climate. Not necessarily what is there at the moment, um, but um, it's what could grow. So you can see the gray area, much of the Western Kenai is this boreal forest with coastal influence and intermixed grass and tundra. So like the Caribou Hills might be tundra on uh, the Kenai. Um, and we also have a little bit of prairies and grassland up there in the uh, northwest corner of the Kenai. Uh, that isn't presently in grassland. It's uh, hardwood forest, 69 burn, like we saw uh, on the slide. But it could be grass and, and prairie. Um, if we just started from scratch there. So the, the present climate uh, would permit that. And Okay, so now we go forward to 2039, and you can see that prairies and grassland is expanding quite a bit. It's coming down the peninsula and expanding northward uh, from Anchorage. Uh, 2069, it's expanding quite a bit more. Um, Caribou Hills are, are still uh, royal forest with uh, tundra and so forth, but by 2099, um, pretty much all of the Western Kenai is, is in the, the prairies and grassland uh, niche. And notice that Southwestern Alaska uh, is very much showing the same vegetation possibility as well. So let me run through that again, just so you can see it, 2009, 2039, 69 and 99. Um, so this, this is a strong argument for saying that uh, the Western Kenai could become a grassland. Now, uh, an entirely different style of modeling using the uh, random forest platform, uh, work of Don Magnus here at the Kenai Refuge. Um, the baseline on the left is showing the vegetation uh, as it is now, I think just 10, veg types. It's similar to the uh, satellite map that we looked at showing the, the two big burns. Um, you can see a lot of, um, in the northern part, the, the, the conifer, black spruce, uh, and then that's projecting forward to the end of the century, becoming more hardwoods. But the, the transformation on the southern end is, is more striking because uh, there the uh, Kind of the, the background color here is um, white Sitka spruce or Lutz spruce uh, shrubs and, and alpine. Um, and that is shifting to a, a different a light gray color here, which is essentially herbaceous or, or grassland. Um, so again, this is uh, another argument for at least the southern part of the uh, Kenai Peninsula becoming a, a grassland. Well, um, I have, uh, have an alternative hypothesis because of my work on the, the lake levels that I have seen just how dry it can become. <laughs> uh, before I had the lake level record, I had no idea that this place could dry out to the degree of, of lowering lake levels, you know, 20 or 30 feet. Um, so my conjecture is that uh, we are already uh, started on this uh, trajectory toward a drier, a much drier, uh, 
Western Kenai, and the fire regime accompanying that, of course, will be much more frequent fires. Um, the fires will be more widespread because we now have black spruce in the muskegs, which will bridge the fire over the uplands. So uh, it'll be possible to quickly burn large areas. And then because of the dryness, the degree of burn severity will be much greater. And that um, there may be grasslands there, but extremely severe fires will simply burn out the grass and expose the mineral soil and then birch will recruit after that. Um, so kind of to, uh, to conclude, I'd say we you know, have strong evidence uh, on both sides here, the, the modeling, um, looking for a grassland and a hardwood forest based on the, um, the prehistoric <laughs> record, shall we say, of, of the extreme drought. And it could be there's just a difference in time scales here that uh, we may well go through the grassland period. These, these climate models that I showed you, you know, only go up to um, 2100. That is uh, within the lifetime of uh, children being born today. We'll, we'll see that. Um, climate warming will continue to go on, you know, uh, for many centuries. And, and I don't know why the modelers don't run those models out to, you know, 2,500 or something, but uh, it, uh, they're scary enough to run out to 2,100, I guess. <laughs> but uh, I have a, a longer term view of it. So uh, I'm thinking that it, it may take several centuries to dry out the Kenai well enough to get uh, the conversion to hardwood forest, but uh, I'm forecasting that it will come. So that is the um, end of my talk today, and um, I thank you very much for, for joining me.